Hi, everyone. This is Scott McLeod. Welcome to another episode of the Coronavirus Chronicles. I am absolutely delighted to have with me today Jim Christensen. He is a faculty colleague at the University of Colorado, Denver, and also is the CEO of the Aero Academy Charter School down in the Houston, Texas area. Jim, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks, Dr. McLeod. Great to, great to be with you. <laughs> thanks. Um, so tell us a little bit about how Aero Academy has been responding right now. What does learning and teaching look like? How are you taking care of students, staff, families? What's happening? Yes, for sure. So um, Aero Academy is a, a small charter system uh, in the inner city of Houston focused on high poverty environments. Uh, we have about 98% of our kids on, on a reduced free and reduced lunch program. So uh, you know, when, when we first got the information around the closure, our first instincts were to make sure we were feeding our kids the most basic fundamental expectation of, of survival. And that, uh, we were able to launch that in about two weeks. Uh, we started with a daily drive through and then we've been able to move that to a once a week so we can supply seven days worth of food to all of our families. We have a, a, a preheated meal system uh, with, you know, distrib distribution of fruit and gallons of milk uh, every week. It's going really well. We have about 100% participation. Almost everyone participates. We accept anyone uh, under the age of 18 to come through our, our drive through and pick up food. So it doesn't even matter if they're a part of our school system or not. They have access to the food. So. Uh, that's that was our first deployment, which went very well. The second component for us was the access of being online at home. And in Aero Academy, about 40% of our students don't have any access, nor do they have the the tech the, the computer equipment to operate any any software package. So. That was our big challenge. We uh, went into an in investment of Chromebooks. We have uh, one to one, but we actually needed to upgrade a lot of this. Uh, simple things like getting your electrical cords to work right and etc. Right. So, sure. so we went into a mass distribution as well as um, supporting our families and understanding where and how they get free internet access. Okay. Uh, from our teaching side of this, our teachers were um, basically platooning into the school because the school is still the cog for our community. Uh, so they platoon in and they, you know, followed all the, the guidelines and practices of, of uh, safety. And, but they have about a two to three day each teacher uh, coming into the system and participating from the classroom. They actually wanted to do that just to maintain this whole working professional concept and, and anyone that didn't want to do that, we did not ask them or require them to do it, but it's been very valuable for us uh, to actually have some engagement, uh, consistent engagement uh, in, in live, live action. So the fundamentals of distributing the, the whole concept of learning online at home um was was a challenge for us and we had to get that up and running we first started with uh a lot of hard copy note workbooks etc things that were going on where they could be doing their grade level work and then it, it took us another two weeks to get online to where we are actually now for the past two weeks completely been online so it was a two week two week two week process uh, our teachers are very familiar using software because we're a blended learning school, but the, the role of converting all that uh, to um, a face-to-face -face with the screen um, was challenging for us. We're pretty open about that, and we're, we're, we think we're where we need to be now. Right. We are concerned about the virus gap. Our kids are already a one to two, three years behind, so that achievement gap has always existed. And we really worked hard to reduce that, but now with the virus gap, we it's compounding it, and we're really trying to figure out, think ahead for our our whole learning compacting process and how we're going to make up 
uh, 12 weeks of learning over the next year and be prepared for the examinations that the state of Texas imposes on us. So. Right, right. So, Jim, you're the first person I've talked to whose organization has started platooning teachers into their physical classrooms. So I mm -hmm. think that's pretty interesting. What are you hearing from families right now about how learning and teaching is going? I mean, you know, you have a challenging demographic in some ways. So how are mm -hmm. people handling the teacher at home role? <laughs> Well, the, uh, yeah, the, 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 the teacher side, you know, we have uh, some teachers that have three and four children and, and then they're teaching their entire classroom. So we, we provide a lot of flexibility um, as, a, as a come and go location for, for our school. But the resources they want and need are still at school and they're easily accessible. They grab their books, they read from the books that are in the library, they're all leveled. Uh, you know, they use some software such as Raz Kids where they're complimenting, you're going online to read while I'm reading to you. Uh, so that's where the interest in being on site and back in a classroom for a couple hours a day was really important to them. From the student perspective, we, we have about an 80%, they're, they're going full speed and working hard with us. And we have 20% we, we are struggling to reach and uh, get them engaged in this. Uh, you know, our, our community, uh, we have high mobility mm -hmm. and we see multifamily uh, focus right now in terms of living conditions and some of the, that means moving from Houston to New Orleans and et cetera. So that's been tough for us and uh, we are, are concerned about being, since we're a choice system, um, where the kids will end up and go. We, we're unable to predict enrollment forecasting or anything like that right now. So we're just trying to do this one week at a time, focus on the kids and their best interest, uh, but recognize our, our world will be different in August. And we are planning for potential come to school for two weeks and then have to go home for two weeks. We, we just, we expect some of those things to happen. Right, right. So Jim, as you think about the leadership team and, and how you all have responded over the last six weeks or so, what do you think you've done that's worked really well? What's been productive for you? Well, I think we, we had a clear strategy um, early on. You know, you do that upfront work mm -hmm. and we didn't wait for sometimes a governor's status of, of a waiver, or we uh, had a good strong support system from our, our local uh, state agency. They had daily briefings for us, and we were able to collaborate and get a clear understanding on such things as special education and some of the areas that we weren't quite sure about. So the, the upfront planning of what's going really well clearly was our our families are happy with us. They're not disgruntled. And that's, that's important that they feel uh, we are, are doing our best job to, to take care of their children and learning and socially, emotionally. Um, what I would say we, I struggled a little bit with was our, our level of variability in our teacher delivery systems online when we first started that. It was quite significant. So we've really spent some catch-up time putting some non-negotiables expectations in place and how you do some things online uh, versus just post a video or, or things like that. <laughs> okay, yeah, that all makes sense. Um, so challenges looking forward, I mean, you're a charter academy here that puts a different lens on some of this work. Um, what are some of the issues or concerns that you see looking forward? Well, our biggest challenge is we're going to recognize we're doing our best with this homeschool learning online environment remotely, but we know that's not going to keep our kids at the level of performance we want to see. Yep. And so our biggest challenge is, is compacting that learning next year. We are rethinking such things as departmentalization. We already do some of this. We're gonna accelerate maybe our practices in departmentalization to or how we're gonna organize, create flexible groupings because our kids are gonna come with 
even wider array of skill sets and knowledge that's right and uh, so all of that is on the table for us on how we can uh, first of all monitor where our kids are when they they, they re-enter and and then go from that point on a lot of flexible grouping uh redefining our master schedule um, having our teachers move into the the notion of i'm their, where their strengths are. I'm a strong math teacher, so I want to teach math, and you teach ELA, and this, let's regroup our kids accordingly and, and get them where they need to go. Right. So, you know, Jim, I think you bring up a really important point here, which is that we've always known the value of pretesting, but this spring has really brought the need for that home in terms of next fall, right? Yeah. But what may be the first time ever for most school systems they're going to really need to do just a phenomenal job of pre-testing early on when the kids get back with us just to figure out where everybody is, right? That's exactly right. And, and we've used a system for eight years, you know, in the MAP system, which works for us. And so we've, we've done that three times a year, and we're really glad we have that in place and up and running. So we can, we'll be able to detect actually the loss of learning that we witnessed. Um, but that pre-assessment is gonna be critically important. Uh, the whole notion of, of grade levels takes on a different meaning now. And, uh, you know, in our state, we, we've been told we'll be held to the same accountability expectations of performance uh, next May. And so uh, the standard-based delivery system is gonna really take a different look for us and how we uh, approach teaching and learning and and I call it just this macro action. We have to have a system-wide, school-wide system macro action of work that is creating the schedules and the system of how we're going to deliver that. It's not just a teacher saying go differentiate. That's a we're way beyond that now in terms of difficulty. Oh yeah, absolutely. And and uh, you know, some schools like yours are going to be very thoughtful and planful about that over the summer, and some others are going to struggle with that. So I wish you luck with that work. It's going to be yeah, thank you, uh, challenging and complex, but also will probably pay off in the long run. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to share here at the end of our time? Well, I I will tell you, I've been in education a long time, and thirty five years, I think, and I could not be more proud of the educators. You know, they, they have, everywhere I go, I just see, you when you see teachers driving by homes and, and stopping and talking to their kids, or you see principals working 16 hours a day to get kids food and et cetera. And, and it's just, a, it's been a very uh, difficult time, but never been more proud to be an educator. Absolutely. What a great way to end this conversation. Thank you, Jim, for joining me. Good luck to you and everybody at Aero Academy and uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you.